Hi, welcome to my latest YouTube video. I'm Ross Rosenberg. I'm the author of The Human Magnet Syndrome and the creator of the Codependency Cure, otherwise known as the Self-Love Recovery Treatment Program and the Hitch Trauma Technique. Today I'm going to talk about a concept that I created six years ago and also did a YouTube video on it probably, probably two years ago. The reason that I am doing it over again or updating it is because of the tremendous shifts that I've had in the understanding of self-love deficit disorder, aka codependency, and the treatment of it. As many of you know, I created the Self-Love Recovery Treatment Program, which is an 11-stage treatment program that is specifically created, designed, and modified for people who are codependents or what I call self-love deficient or who have self-love deficit disorder. It is constructed of 11 sequential stages. It's a developmental theory. Each stage needs to be accomplished, needs to be mastered in order to build the skills and abilities necessary for the next stage. And this theory has really evolved. In fact, I was going through the graphics not too long ago, and I saw my very first one, which was a three-stage program. And then it went from three to five to six to seven, and then I think it was nine, ten, and it's rested at eleven. But this is not the video that talks about that treatment program. The worst case scenario technique was specifically created for stage six, which is which is entitled Preparing for the Narcissistic Storm and Mastery of Predictive Awareness. In this stage, my clients are led through an arduous, intensive process of learning everything they can about themselves and their connection to the narcissist, the pathological narcissist. They, are, they must learn about how they relate to the narcissist, how they get sucked into the narcissist brand of manipulation, which is all dependent upon the narcissist diagnosis or personality type. What is it about their personality that um, was formed before they met the narcissist that made it easy for the narcissist to manipulate them? And they need to learn everything they can about the narcissist. What type of narcissist? What type of narcissism is this? How does this narcissist best manipulate them? What system of thought, technique, what design do they have in their mind in order to come up with a way to shut down a person, to starve them of love, respect, caring, trust, and protection, but manage to make them stay in the relationship? So essentially, in stage six, preparing for the narcissistic storm, it it is based upon the idea that you cannot set a boundary, the big boundaries uh, on a narcissist until you know exactly what they're capable of in response to it to understand so well that you can predict exactly what they do to get you pulled into it or what you do to help them or how you, the SLD, unconsciously allow them to control you or what you're capable of in setting the boundary and how they can control you, you actually watch them through this predictive process, try to antagonize you, to manipulate you into fighting so that you pretty much are toast. You are I'm at their mercy. Or as I talk about in many, many of my videos, my books, and almost anywhere that I talk about this subject, is the wrestling ring. And it comes from the idea, the, the quote by George Bernard Shaw, Never wrestle with a pig. You'll get dirty, and besides, the pig likes it. And from that saying, I've helped people understand that the way narcissists beat you, dominate, control, and trap, gaslight you, they get you to fight back in a place, whether it's a physical place or a psychological place, where they have mastered the technique of aggressive domination and control. So they want you to fight where they are expert and skilled, and you will predictably fail. So that is the pig who likes wrestling in the mud, who enjoys getting dirty, will want you to step into the wrestling ring and wrestle in the mud. And because SLDs are not pigs, narcissists, 
They don't like to get dirty. They don't know how to fight in the mud. They ultimately lose. So in this stage, stage six, the goal is to predict as much as you can based upon a study of yourself in relationship to the narcissist and understand how you not only have fell victim or prey to the narcissist's brand of manipulation, but also how they controlled you and the interchange between the two. In this stage of my self-love recovery treatment program, prepares you so that you can learn to not fight, which means win. <laughs> That's a paradox. Not fight, but win. Well, if fighting weakens you, if fighting enrages you to the point where you become irrational, if fighting pulls you into the type of defensive or offensive posture that you always are going to be most vulnerable and lose, then fighting is bad. Then if you don't fight, then this is where I bring in my concept, observe, don't absorb. In this stage, you learn your weaknesses, your frailties, your vulnerabilities. You learn the narcissist's strengths, skill sets, and abilities to weaken you, to take away your strength, your voice, your self-esteem. And because you know this, you've mastered it. That's, that's part of the stage. That's why sometimes it takes a while. And you have been introduced the observe, don't absorb technique, which is essentially you are going to artificially, in a healthy way, disassociate from your feelings and watch the narcissist who you have predicted through predictive awareness, through all of the exercises, all of the, the necessary um, uh, skill development um, exercises, discussion, psychotherapy, you will know how they're going to pull you into the wrestling ring. And so the idea of watching them without an emotional connection to observe, watching them knowing how they pull you in, predicting it, predictive awareness, understanding that if they can trigger you, they can activate you to get mad, you'll fight them. You'll get into the wrestling ring, get dirty, and you know what happens. So when you observe and you don't absorb, you are going to beat them by not fighting. And it works all the time. So with all of this in the background, you are ready um, when you are in my treatment program to be introduced the concept, the worst case scenario. It is because SLDs, people with self-love deficit disorder or codependence, catastrophize. They tend to jump, jump to conclusions. They tend to think first, almost reactively, almost instinctively, of the absolute worst thing that could happen to them, which is often much worse than really is, is possible. But they go to the catastrophes. They go to the past traumas. They go to the gaslighting. They go to what the narcissist has taught them invisibly and secretly to believe that they are powerless, they are weak, that if they fight, they will get punished. And if they don't get punished, someone else will get punished. And so they are so afraid to fight back because when they do the self-analysis, they think of the very worst thing, which is not often rational. In fact, rarely rational if you're an SLD who's in a relationship with a pathological narcissist who gaslights because they have involved you in a systematic campaign to manipulate your understanding of yourself, your beliefs of yourself, and your abilities to protect yourself or lack of abilities. And once they get into your head, they make it impossible for you to fight back because you have been rendered powerless because you now believe there's something wrong with you that once never was, or at least is greatly exaggerated. So if you are that manipulated gaslit SLD and you are thinking of say, quitting a job because of your narcissistic boss, breaking up with your narcissistic romantic partner, divorcing your narcissistic spouse, and you think about um, what are the potential consequences, 
and and you of course catastrophize which then if, you know just to use the word everything becomes catastrophic and and you think of all these things that are going to happen that will be so heinously difficult so terrible so painful that you will conclude it's not going to be worth it you will be so intimidated and so disempowered and so pessimistic about any potential plan to escape this web of control whether it's real physical relational psychological control or it's gaslit control where you have you are the one that is holding you you back and you don't know that those ideas were implanted so when I get to the point in my treatment program where I have moved my client um, through all the stages, and we are now at stage six, and they have made significant progress in their understanding of themselves, you have been introduced, um, by the time we talk about this topic, you have been introduced and you have started to understand to the point of mastery, observe, not absorb, you've understood what, gas, what gaslighting is, how it was perpetrated against you, and how it sabotaged your own thought processes and your own ability to protect yourself. With all of that information, with all of those discussions, then it becomes time to actually calculate what will happen when you finally set boundaries in a hostile environment. Now that is stage seven. That is why stage six comes before stage seven. And instead of catastrophizing, instead of believing there's no way out, instead of believing that you're essentially unlovable, that your core shame is so deep and pervasive, you can't get out from underneath that boulder. Instead of falling prey to the gaslit, pessimistic, self-defeating, self-sabotaging beliefs that you're not going to be able to overcome that wall of challenges that the narcissist had put in front of you. And, and the worst part of that, that, that wall, is your beliefs of your inabilities, your weaknesses, and your susceptibility to fall prey to the narcissist. So now that you have an understanding of your SLDD and what happened to you, and you have an understanding of the narcissist and what they've done to render you powerless, and you are really at a point of good, solid mental health. Now it's time to talk about the actual boundary. And that could be divorce. That could be you can't touch me or hurt me or I'll call the police. That can be I quit. It can be so many different variations of the same theme, which is basically to finally tell the narcissist, you're done. You are not going to accept any of the harm that they perpetrate on you, whether it's overtly aggressive, covertly aggressive, passive aggressive, secretive, gaslighting, but you have gotten to the point where you understand what has happened and what has rendered you powerless. You understand what they did in order to do that. And you have a plan on how to keep yourself outside of the domain of power and control. And that is the observe, don't absorb technique. So now it's time to calculate the probability of success. And one, two, or three, as many different type of scenarios as you can think of that are necessary to escape the nightmare, the prison, the dysfunctional relationship. If you can't accurately predict the challenges, the consequences of an action, the consequences of an inaction, the consequences of various actions that are reactive and connected to each other. If you can look at the interactional dynamic between you setting a boundary, you making a threat that you are going to follow through, then you have to understand realistically, precisely, what is the risk. The, the, the best way to determine the strategy to move forward is to have an, an accurate analysis of the probability of success. If your husband 
is six foot four and you are five feet tall and weigh 110 pounds and he's a beefy 400 pound muscular guy it's not going to be a, a wise move to use physical force and so the probability of that being successful is very low so that's an obvious way to analyze a worst case scenario um, if you are going to use physical force on this big tall bully brute of a, a person the probability of a really bad worst case scenario is, is high that you might be hurt physically maybe even hospitalized maybe even killed so the goal is to clearly understand what you have to do and let's say that is to protect your children protect your financial your occupational your personal emotional you have to figure out what will happen in reaction to what you will do and you have to come up with the very worst case scenario now listen carefully it has to be accurate the very worst case scenario of what will happen when you do various different strategies reactions boundaries statements what will happen that is realistic and it is crucial that it is realistic which is why the stages that preceded um, the current stage stage six are so important because if you catastrophize if you decide on what to do and what not to do based upon a gas lit frame of reference a gas lit thought process if you make those decisions on what really is the worst case scenario based upon a lifetime of always losing based upon being manipulated based upon someone preying on your weaknesses you are not going to figure out a precisely accurate worst case scenario so once you can accurately with the help of your psychotherapist who's involved in this treatment program are able to come up with an accurate worst case scenario based upon the scenario you're talking about then you ask yourself and of course you'll have help with your therapist can you survive and you ask yourself what the answer of that question which could be yeah no <laughs> or i don't know but let's say you are terrified for a female sld and you are divorcing um, a grandiose pathological narcissist who has a history of battery and you are going to serve him with divorce papers tell him you're going to divorce him whatever is the strategy on letting him know of the divorce you have to think of the worst case scenario and it would be dangerous to under calculate to say well he probably won't hurt me or hit me or beat me up because he knows that he doesn't want to get arrested again or you know the lawyers will just eat him up in court well that's not accurate because you're not considering the narcissist's lack of rational thought their reactiveness their narcissistic injury the goal that i have or a therapist should have is to help the client understand that their version of the worst case scenario is nowhere near the severity of what actually can happen or on the contrary help the client know that their worst case scenario is way over exaggerated it is not possible they are predicting such overwhelming losses and consequences that is mostly in their head and of course that's co um, common in gaslighting so in the case of this the worst case scenario and I'm just being general because there are so many factors to include and to understand is there is a restraining order in this person he has demonstrated fear and anxiety about getting arrested he is not really the bully or the aggressive threat that he pretends to be and with the threat of going back to jail or being put into jail or being fined he doesn't do anything so then the worst case scenario would be you have a restraining order you have a relationship with people at the local police department and in that case that that would be a case and he is nothing more than a bully who doesn't really do anything the worst case scenario is he'll yell he'll scream uh, hit a wall but he won't touch you 
or in the case of a restraining order, he won't come near you according to the specifications of the restraining order. And you make that decision based upon a, a careful analysis of facts, of history, of understanding of the mental health of that person in relationship to the threat. But now let's take the worst case scenario of someone who has no impulse control, who is more sociopathic than narcissistic, who does not have respect for someone's safety, who has a history of battery, of hurting people, of injuring people, has spent time in jail for aggravated battery. Well, the worst case scenario is with this person, he could kill you. And that is accurate. And if that's the case, then everything that you talk about has to be in reaction to this realistic worst case scenario, including what you do. You might have to modify everything just to make sure you're safe or your children or your family is safe. That is an extreme use of the worst case scenario. So let me summarize that and then use a more subtle uh, um, example. If someone threatens physical battery harm and they and after discussing it analyzing it and going over uh, all the facts and all of what you know you've concluded that the worst case scenario does not involve you being at physical risk of harm and that the threat of jail prosecution public humiliation has always made this person back down and he's more of a grandstander, more of a, of a, a bully without any um, ability to stand up when someone is stronger than him, he'll back down. Then you go through your, your calculations on what you should do and how you should do it and how you set the boundary. And you're not afraid. See, the goal of the worst case scenario technique, and listen very carefully, is to take irrational fear out of the equation. If you have to do the hardest thing that you've ever done in your life, and that is set a boundary with a narcissist that essentially is going to lead to the end of the relationship, that essentially is going to bring up every negative, threatening, intimidating part of this person and involve them to try to use any type of power and control strategy, then you have to know what you're dealing with. You cannot let yourself get afraid irrationally. Fear that's irrational is what the narcissist uses against you, whether it's through gaslighting, triangulating your children, sabotaging relationships, threatening you, verbally abusing you, all sorts of areas. Fear can be very healthy if it is understood realistically and it guides you in understanding what you should and couldn't do, excuse me, what you should or should not do in order to escape. If you are afraid of something and you understand what you're afraid of and you can be very specific in what it is, the worst case scenario, now you know what the decisions have to be about. What do you do if you are afraid of being killed by your narcissist? Okay, there's a lot of things you can do and a lot of things you shouldn't do. And this is not the place to talk about this in the video. What should you do or shouldn't do if your narcissist is just a bully who doesn't do much of anything other than try to get in your head and scare you? There's a lot of things you should and shouldn't do. The fear component, the intimidation, whether it's real or it's gaslit, is what trips up every SLD that I know. Through the use of the worst case scenario technique, which is an accurate analysis of the very worst thing that is possible, considering all of the background um, potential obstacles, mitigating factors, weaknesses, vulnerabilities, strengths. And if you are afraid, then you use that fear to build a defense, defensive posture, a defensive plan, and you will be as safe as you could ever be. That is why 
it's so important to make sure your worst case scenario is accurate because then you do a plan. So now let's look at it more subtly. You want to make an appointment with an attorney to find out what your options are in divorce. And you are terrified that if your wife, say you are a SLD male, and your your wife or partner is the pathological narcissist, and you're absolutely terrified that if she finds out, she will find out find a way to hurt you, to sabotage you, to turn the kids against you, to take away your custody of the kids, to empty the bank account, to hurt you physically, to hurt you in any way. And if, and if you get caught up in that fear that if I see an attorney, it won't be worth it because I can't win against him because he's a perfect liar and no one believes me. Well, that's the type of thinking that does not do well in this exercise. The worst case scenario requires you to be accurate based upon what you know about your SLD, your SLDD, what you know about the narcissist, and remember the interaction. So with my help or a treatment practitioner's help, you clearly, you concretely, you logically talk about what you're going to do, how you're going to do it. You're going to contact an attorney. If you do it this way, you can't get caught. And if you can't get caught, there's nothing to worry about. Or if you do get caught, then you think of the worst case scenario. And then you take fear, irrational fear, out of the equation. Your wife finds out you're going to see an attorney. And you and your therapist, and you tell your therapist, well, my worst case scenario is I'll lose the custody of the kids. You know, she is the mom, the courts believe her. You know, she has me blackmailed over stuff that actually is not really true. And if it is, it represents me 25 years ago. Or whatever is the vulnerable, negative, self-sabotaging, gaslight thinking process. The job of the therapist, the treatment practitioner in my self-love recovery treatment program is to challenge those thoughts and to say to, to convince the, the, your client that it, either it's not possible it's partially possible, or if you do or don't do this, you've neutralized the threat. And say, for example, um, I'll lose custody of my kids. Well, sometimes just some regular facts are what does the trick. And, and like in the state of Illinois, where I used to live, um, I know how the divorce family courts work. Now, as a default, share equal custody. And it's more of the exception than the rule for one to get custody, full custody. And, and, and so what I would help my client understand is how the court system works, how judges work, how a, um, a attorney assigned to the kid works, how do these evaluations work, and explain, well, you know, if you have a custody battle, there's going to be a test. You're, you are going to get a battery of tests, a psychological test. He will get a battery of tests. They will interview collateral sources. Uh, they will talk to the kids. They will observe that parent with the kids and their parenting capabilities. They will talk to people, um, if there's police reports, a marital therapist. And they will get enough information in order to back up your claim of being afraid being intimidated or back up your claim that he is or she is, excuse me, in this case, she is dangerous, harmful, which will not, which will neutralize their claim of the opposite, which isn't true. So the worst case scenario in the case of seeing an attorney, all of a sudden is a lot of money, um, a lengthy court battle, one that you will likely win as long as you understand what winning is. And for those people who are in my podcast, I just quoted winning, air quotes. And you calculate the cost of money. And then let's say someone says, well, I can't afford it. And then you have to, as part of the therapist's uh, job, is to help them understand what is real and rational fear. What is 
gaslit fear, gaslit pessimistic projections, or accurate pessimistic projections, or accurate fear. And in the case of this, what you put together all the information that is accurate, because the goal of the therapist is not to be the, the cheerleader, the, 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 the tireless advocate of, uh, of the client who only talks about pos optimistic possibilities. And you start to put together a picture of what actually could happen, which might not be pretty, but with an accurate worst case scenario. Then you go back and you ask yourself, and this is the big question as it was with the first um, example, can you survive it? Can you do this, get through it, and move beyond it so that you can get what you want? Or if you do this, the consequences will be far more serious than the potential opportunities. And in any of the worst case scenario discussions, when that is the conclusion, well, you know, if I, I go to court, I'm going to lose because I have a mental illness. I am bipolar. I haven't always taken my medicine. Um, I have this 10 year history of um, alcoholism. But I, even though I'm taking my medicine now, and I've been in and out of rehab facilities. And once the Department of Children and Family Services investigated me for, the, uh, um, for hurting my kids, and, and I did when I was drunk. And then the worst case scenario is you probably are going to lose. And that is not, that's neither optimistic or pessimistic. It is an accurate evaluation so that you can make a decision what to do. So, in conclusion, the power of the worst case scenario technique is to disable irrational fear based upon improbable outcomes. Say it again. The goal, the primary impetus of using the worst case scenario technique is to neutralize irrational fear over improbable outcomes is to find out exactly what is accurately, objectively, in a very neutral um, type of analysis, what is the worst thing that could happen. And then with the help of another person, a psychotherapist, is to see if you can find a way to survive that and get to where you want to be safely. Should you want any more information on this topic, I have a six-hour seminar audio and video presentation on tips, tools, and strategies of escaping narcissistic abuse. It is a part of a, a three-part educational series on narcissism and everything you need to know about narcissists, narcissistic abuse, and relationships with narcissists. All of that information can be found at selfloverecovery.com. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. And if you are a fan of my podcast, let people know. And lastly, make a comment. Because anything that you write, whether it's a comment, a request, uh, something that, that you disagree with or something you agree with, there's a community out there that needs to have this discussion. And I call that community self-love recovery community. Okay? I hope this discussion was beneficial. And again, should you want more information, do not hesitate to drop us a line at help at selfloverecovery.com or just go to selfloverecovery.com. Be well. Take care.